Whether you prefer a Pilsner, a Porter, or a Pale Ale, it seems these days there is a brewery in San Antonio for everyone. The craft beer boom almost seemed to kind of come out of nowhere. And while you may think this local beer explosion is recent, San Antonio has a history as a brew town that dates back more than 150 years. San Antonio is definitely an anomaly um, because of the German influence. Germans are thirsty people. They like their beer. In fact, San Antonio's first brewery opened in Alamo Plaza just 19 years after that famous battle. And over the next several decades, San Antonio became the brewing capital of Texas. But at some point, the once booming industry tapped out and it's taken some time for the local beer business to build back up. It's really nice to you know, put San Antonio back on the map again. We're taking a look at San Antonio's storied beer history, the changes in Texas laws that are helping the industry thrive, and meeting some of the local brewers who may just be behind your favorite craft beer. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. On demand, in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscasts throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. This week, the Explains team is looking into our local beer industry's past and future. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. We're here at one of the most recognizable San Antonio landmarks, what was once the Pearl Brewery. Today, simply the Pearl, full of apartments, shops, and restaurants, a place for people to come and gather. But this brewery used to be a huge part of San Antonio's beer history. And while you may think of the Pearl when it comes to San Antonio brewing, it's actually one piece of a much larger puzzle. San Antonio has some awesome beer, and we can thank the German, Austrian, and Czech immigrants who settled in San Antonio and surrounding areas back in the mid-1800s. I mean, Germans are thirsty people. They like their beer. Charlie Stats is a self-proclaimed beer history nut. I started collecting beer advertising when I was 13, and I'm now 58. He used to work at the Pearl Brewery in the 1980s. I just totally went off the deep end in collecting Pearl, and really then getting into the history. Charlie now has a huge collection of beer advertisements and memorabilia, some dating back to San Antonio's earliest days as a brewery town. He says back then, cost was an incentive for migrants to brew their own beer because most of it came from out of state. Since it came so far by the time it got here, it was also very expensive. Um, so all the Germans knew, hey, we can make it better. We can make it cheaper. You know, we got great San Antonio water. San Antonio's brewing history is believed to have all started here, the Minger Hotel. In 1855, the first licensed, actual licensed commercial brewery opened, which means they had a manufacturer's license with the state of Texas, and it was a man named William Minger, a German immigrant. Travis Poling is the co-author of San Antonio Beer, Alamo City History by the Pint. Minger's brewery didn't just distribute locally. He distributed as far west as is San Angelo, which back then was called Fort Concho, and as far east as Galveston, and then also uh, down to the valley. The hotel didn't exist just yet, but Minger's Western Brewery was so popular, customers often crashed there or at his wife's boarding house next door. So they quickly realized they needed to expand. The Minger Hotel opened in 1859. It was two stories, but it opened as an immediate success and then he transferred out of the beer business into the hotel business. The brewery was moved to the tunnels underneath the hotel. The address was uh, in the 240 Blum Street range. So we're 204 Alamo Plaza. So if you think about the mall, River Center Mall, that runs along Blum Street. So the brewery had to be within a stone's throw of this hotel. And we know that there are under, uh, underground passages that connected the brewery. The tunnel served as fermentation and storage space for the grain, hops, and yeast. And the brewery's popularity continued to grow, including during the Civil War. Here's the bar tab book for the Minger Hotel. It has both Union and Confederate officers 
drinking in the, in the Minger bar. Minger's Brewery was in business until 1878. That year, it was considered one of the largest producers in Texas. During the 1870s, there were dozens of breweries operating in the greater San Antonio area. Some survived and some didn't, thanks to competition from beer giants Budweiser and Anheuser-Busch. One such example was William Esser's Brewery. It opened up in 1874. Ten years later, beer magnate Adolphus Busch bought it and renamed it Lone Star. It's now known as the San Antonio Museum of Art. That's the building. It was founded by you know, roughly around nine local businessmen and one other. The one other happened to be Adolphus Bush. Adolphus Bush hired Otto Kaler as a manager. Otto would later leave Lone Star and take over the Pearl. Lone Star, which was located on Jones Avenue, was the first large mechanized brewery in Texas. But it wasn't the only major player in the brewing industry. The Pearl Brewery got its start in 1883. They reached a point where they were both pretty much nick and nick in production and also statewide distrib distribution. The Pearl was originally known as the San Antonio Brewing Association and by a few other names because back then there were a lot of brewery owners who would either sell or get bought out. It's a lot to keep track of. So back to the main story. The Pearl is named after its iconic beer. It was created in 1887, formulated and first brewed in Bremen, Germany. The beer got its name from the brewmaster who thought the foamy bubbles in a freshly poured glass resembled sparkling pearls. By 1916, the Pearl was the largest brewery in Texas. While Prohibition forced Lone Star to close in 1919, the Pearl pivoted. Otto Kaler's widow, Emma Kaler, kept it going by you know, using their, their auto shop for repair people's cars. They were making sodas, orange crush sodas. They were making ice cream. They were making malt for malted milk. They were using every, every piece of the equipment that was part of the brewing process and part of maintaining a manufacturing facility to kind of keep this thing going during Prohibition. So they were the first brewery actually in the entire Southwest to, uh, to reopen when Prohibition was lifted. Despite reopening once Prohibition was lifted in 1933, Emma faced another challenge, the Great Depression. They sold off uh, the soda bottling portion of the brewery to a company who still operated it on the brewery grounds. And uh, then they got into back into making full strength beer. Emma managed to keep the brewery afloat by selling beer to those who could afford it. Around the same year, Sabinas Brewing was built on Lone Star Boulevard. It would later become home to the beer we all know as Lone Star. It had a, a very large run and, and following. They even opened up a second location in Oklahoma City in the early 60s. Their, their sales never really exceeded pearls until you know, the 1970s. In 1952, the San Antonio Brewing Association officially became the Pearl Brewing Company, because honestly, the name was confusing people. In the 1950s, Pearl was the number one selling beer, but by 1968, it was at the bottom of that list, because once again, the beer giants kept getting bigger. In 1985, Pabst Brewing Company took over the Pearl. It only survived for another 15 years, and the doors closed in 2001. This is the site of the old Lone Star Brewery. It's been 25 years since beer was brewed here. Today, Lone Star is still popular in Texas, but it's owned by Pabst and made under contract by Miller Coors Brewing in Fort Worth. Pearl also owned by Pabst, and since the summer of 2020, has been brewed out of Austin. So those iconic beers no longer made here in San Antonio. But there are other local breweries operating today in their place. If you feel like some of them may have popped up overnight, you're not alone in that. Case that explains producer Lexi Salazar says the change in the craft beer scene isn't by chance. It's the result of work going on behind the scenes to change Texas law. People in Texas have always liked beer. They've always liked good beer. But up until recently, operating a successful microbrewery or brew pub was a challenge thanks to state laws. In 1993, the state of Texas legalized brew pubs. I got started home brewing back in the early 90s while I was in college up in Austin. And that was like right when they first passed the brew pub bill to where basically restaurants could make beer and sell it right there on location. Texas was behind the curve at this point. 41 states already allowed brew pubs to operate. But after Texas joined the club, the experimentation began. I worked at the first uh, brew pub in Texas, uh, Waterloo Brewing Company, which closed in 2001. I also worked at the Salas Brewery 
um, before it closed and I came back to my hometown. I, I grew up here and uh, worked at the laboratory brewing company for a couple years before it closed. That's Jason Davis. His experience also includes some time at San Antonio's oldest brew pub, Blue Star. Jason eventually joined forces with Freetail Brewing founder Scott Metzger. They launched Freetail in 2008, north of Chavano Park. Over the past 13 years, business has exploded. They've even opened a tap room on the south side. And Scott was instrumental in working alongside the Texas Craft Brewers Guild to help change even more laws to further the beer industry in the state and 2013 was a big year for change. For the first time, brew pubs could sell their brews to grocery stores and restaurants. And they also changed it to where breweries could actually sell beer in their tap room. Before that, people would have to have tours that they were giving and then they'd have to give the beer away. I'm not originally from Texas, so uh, it, it was an eye-opening experience to, to learn about some of our antiquated uh, beer laws uh, and liquor laws in general. After moving to San Antonio for a teaching job, Dustin Baker saw an opportunity to make a business out of a hobby. Like so many others, I was homebrewing uh, and, and producing a little bit too much beer to drink it on our own. Dustin and his wife opened doors to Roadmap Brewing in 2018. And we were really modeling ourselves after, after the amazing places we saw other places in the country and kind of looked around San Antonio and realized this could work here. Another San Antonio transplant is behind one of our city's most well-known and successful breweries. Marcus Baskerville started bringing the beer he was brewing at home to local bars and restaurants for feedback. Things changed for him when a brewery let him do a tap takeover. The beers that we ended up having on tap ended up doing so well that the brewery offered me an assistant brewing job. He took the job, learned the trade, and ended up opening his own project, Weathered Souls, in 2016 on the north side. At around the time Weathered Souls opened, Vera Deckard was preparing to open her own spot in Southtown. Again, the idea to open her own brewery came from a hobby that had gotten pretty intense. One day, Brent, my husband, comes home and there's microscopes and magazines and Erlenmeyer flasks and freezers for fermentation vessels, like everywhere in our house. And he's just like, you know, this is kind of like Breaking Bad. <laughs> he says, you're going to have to either tone this down or you, you we, we're going to just go pro. And I'm like, well, I don't really know how to pro tone it down because it's so much fun. I'm so passionate about it. Uh, let's go pro. Vera, who was born and raised in Germany, used South Texas and German influence as inspiration. That was really um, important to me to tie the two together. That's why we have the Echo mit Liebe slogan, which means uh, made with love. That inspiration also helped her come up with the brewery's name. Kunstler is German for artist. We are in the Southtown um, Arts District. We also like to feature local artists, um, and it also appeals to the, the art of brewing beer. The legislative changes of 2013 were some of the biggest drivers of change in the industry, but there have been other updates in laws since then. And more recently, just this past session uh, in 2019, um, we, got, we got the law changed to where uh, breweries could also sell some beer to go, two cases per day per person. All of these changing laws have helped usher in a new wave of breweries. Everyone we talk to welcomes all the newcomers. We're a very unique industry in the sense that we don't necessarily have competitors, uh, we have compadres. It's just fun to see the city grow and we're nowhere near reaching our cap. We all work really well together. That's Tim Castaneda, co-owner of one of the city's newer spots, Black Laboratory Brewing on the east side. Black Laboratory has made a name for itself with its experimental brews. More on that later. Every brew pub and brewery in town offers something different but they all do have at least one thing in common. They all hope to be a place for community. Beer is all about community and about a conversation and, and being with your friends and, and socializing. We're not open late for a reason, because uh, no one's coming here to slam back beers and get really hammered and have a crazy night. Uh, you're coming here to, to enjoy your time with the person that you're having a couple beers with, have a conversation, play a board game or two, um, all the things that you would do if you were having someone over to your own house. It's clear that San Antonio has made its mark on the brewing industry, but as you've heard, some of the beers made here have long since fizzled out. The places they once called home, though, have found new life. It's an effort that's taken years with plenty of stops and starts, and some are still trying.
Just about everyone knows about the pearl. Tourists and locals alike are drawn to it these days. You know by now that Pabst shut down brewing here in 2001. That same year, Silver Ventures, a local investment firm, bought the 23-acre property with plans to turn it into what it is today. Shops, restaurants, a hotel, a place for people to hang out. For a few years, the Pearl sat empty, but then in 2006, the very first tenant opened its doors. And since then, the place has exploded, becoming a main attraction citywide. Just south of the Pearl sits the San Antonio Museum of Art, which used to be the Lone Star Brewery. In 1918, Lone Star was selling 65,000 barrels of beer a year throughout Texas and the rest of the country. But then came Prohibition. Lone Star didn't weather that well and was forced to close. In the 1970s, the museum acquired the old brewery buildings and then opened in 1981. Today, the San Antonio Museum of Art sits along the bustling northern reaches of the Riverwalk. But as we've told you, that wasn't the end of Lone Star Brewing in San Antonio. Prohibition ended in 1933, and around the same time, a new Lone Star Brewery complex opened along Mission Road. The beer started brewing here in 1940, but then operations stopped in 1996. Every city is kind of is going through the same process of thinking about what do we do with this old industrial space? because we're not an industrial economy anymore. Professor Christine Drennan points out something that many of us may have forgotten over the years. Breweries were factories. They are a relic of an industrial past, um, an industrial past that was based on factory and production um, and really built the American middle class. And then we lost that. And we have not been able to sustain the American middle class in the kind of in the economy that we've built and that we've replaced it with. Uh, and these places, they represent that, right? They are playgrounds for people with a lot of disposable income, yet the people that work there are service industry employees, you know, and you can't, you probably can't send your kid to college on that income. So they are very indicative of the transformation in the economy in general. There is a new plan for the Lone Star Brewing Complex. It's the latest attempt to breathe new life into this old space. It's kind of the elephant in the room a little bit that we are the fourth you know, uh, sort of development group to come along. Gray Street Partners, a local real estate investment group, is behind the project. Of course, this time is going to be different, right? This time it's going to work and it's going to be great. Although, you know, it's uh, kind of to bluntly put it, one of the reasons it's going to be different is we were able to buy uh, the site in cash. You know, we have no debt and that kind of recession proofs, you know, our plans in a, in a very different way than the prior developers who, who tried. The plans include apartments, retail space and restaurants, a park, areas for people to walk and to bike. It might sound a little familiar. The parallels obviously are impossible to not draw another brewery on the river. I think maybe the word that we're using is um, uh, Lone Star will be slightly more approachable in terms of its uh, of the market. In other words, more affordable. Drennan points to the environmental benefits of replacing these once factories with the mixed use kind of developments we're seeing today. The kind of jobs being replaced at the sites, though, aren't quite the same. But it's not, you know, it's not honestly uh, employing 300 people in middle class jobs anymore. It's for a wealthier demographic to come and consume, not produce. While the purpose, the look and the neighborhoods around these old breweries have and continue to change, the developers in charge of this latest project hope the history of this once San Antonio staple stays they have plans to include it. And so something that we really want to do is push this community outreach uh, to kind of collect those stories. There's a lot of great history that people have had connecting to the site, being on the site, you know, whether they're, you know, fathers or grandparents, you know, worked on the site or they visited all the time as kids. It's not just the breweries that have made an impact on the city. It's gone the other way too. San Antonio has left its mark on the industry. Over the past few years, there has been an explosion of new flavors and ingredients being used in beer. RJ Marquez explains it's just another sign that these establishments are becoming part of the fabric of this community. The flavors, the taste, the culture. San Antonio is home to many unique craft beers. 
and the inspiration behind many of these new brews is rooted right here in the community. This is the area that we belong in and I feel like the beer that we make is for this area and, and for San Antonio. As the city's palate has expanded, so has the experimentation with San Antonio-centric ingredients. The Monster Blood one is just after, you know, a a childhood favorite of candy, you know, green sour belts with chamoy and chili powdery. Tim Castaneda is a San Antonio native and founded Black Laboratory Brewing on the east side. He wanted to create something that reminded people of growing up in the Alamo City. The puro, that one came out and, you know, that was just to make a Piccadilly inspired beer. I had to convince a few people here that weren't from San Antonio, like how good this beer is gonna be. Black Lab is one of many local breweries tapping into this trend. Weathered Souls is set to release La Mangonada. Yes, a Mangonada beer. That uh, is mangoes, chamoy, and um, Mex or chili, um, chili lime salt. Those flavor aspects, those are definitely more gravitated towards the uh, San Antonio uh, palate. Free Tales Budo Pickle Beer is selling faster than they can brew a new batch. There's a lot of consumers out there that like this type of beer, and especially in South Texas. Kunstler is blending the city's Mexican and German beer history. So once a year we bring out a beer, it's the base is a Kölsch, um, which is a German beer, but then we add this cactus fruit to it. San Antonio is also becoming well known for its smooth pilsners and lagers. Some breweries here do Mexican lagers very well. Uh, we have Dale Shine. Bat out of Hellas. And the Hellas is the one that I go back to all the time. It's, it's so drinkable. Puro South Town. So that's a Mexican lager. I had no idea how popular this beer was going to be. It, it just kind of like took me by surprise. Roadmap's Pilsner pays tribute to a popular Texas actor. Our flagship Pilsner is actually called All Right, All Right, All Right. It was designed to be a beer that you could drink in 95 to 100 degree weather. It's this sense of family and community that helped many local breweries like Black Laboratory right here on the east side get through a pretty rough year. The pandemic forced the closure of many tap rooms across the city, but customers came through and supported by many new can releases. And they'd be lining up the parking lots to, to, to come out and get there. Uh, their orders that they placed online. When you see your, your neighbor or your family members start to struggle, you go out and you help them. Uh, and we saw that in massive waves throughout the summer last year. And when the winter storm hit South Texas in February, breweries were there. And you have breweries giving out water, and not just here, but like in Austin and Houston and Dallas, it was happening and I felt like we are now part of that community. We did some clothing drives and uh, we did some uh, water for when the water went out during the freeze, you know, some of the locals came in and picked up some free water. And one of the biggest examples of the impact a brewery can have was last summer's Black is Beautiful campaign, started by Weathered Souls co-founder Marcus Baskerville after George Floyd's murder. The campaign is raising awareness and money for social injustice issues people of color face and police brutality reform. We looked at uh, recently about 308 breweries and tallied uh, you know, what they've donated and the tally was over $1.7 million. Black is Beautiful is now being sold in breweries around the world. I can definitely feel prideful in the sense that the initiative came here. At the end of the day, there's so many different people that are involved within this at this point that put in so much work, um, even other breweries as far as their donations amounts and what they've given back. Coming together for a common cause, combining rich flavors and culture is what has defined the local booming brewery scene. We're from San Antonio as well, and we, this is a little part of the city and that kind of makes us here. It's like we, what we're saying, it's brewed for San Antonio, not just for everybody. Regardless of whether you enjoy the occasional pint, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. The episode is over, mm -hmm. so the show can actually begin now. You're here to walk me through, RJ, these beers. We're going to taste them. The producer Lexi uh, dug out her festive Christmas cups. <laughs> yes. So cheers <laughs> uh, to whatever season. So this is called Dale Shine, and it's their Mexican-style lager. Do we cheer? Yes. Okay, All cheers. Right, awesome. All right. Let's do it. <sighs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I think it's good. It it's is very good. good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is a beer we've talked a lot about. Oh yeah. Black is yeah. beautiful. Yes. So tell me yeah. about this one. All right. So black is beautiful is their imperial stout. Mmm. Very good. Very good. Woo. I'm trying to see what the ABV on this, which is the oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Roadmap. Uh, another very fine brewery here in the San Antonio area. So this is a pilsner. All right. All right. All right. Uh, you know, in honor of Matthew McConaughey. Who said that? 
That would be Matt McConaughey. <laughs> yeah. Probably I, the, in what movie? Probably the future governor of Texas. Who knows at this point? <laughs> okay, we didn't cheers on the last yes, one. We need right. to cheers, we'll on, cheers this on this one. Cheers on this one. Very smooth. Yeah, super yeah. smooth. Next up, pickles. Yes. Pickles. Can't I go wrong with pickles. I heard so much about the pickle beer. Freetail. Yes, this Free is Freetail's pickle, pickle, pickle beer. Right. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers Poodle to pickle. pickles and beer. It smells just like a regular beer. Wow. Ooh, that is tangy. I actually like this, and I'm not a big pickle person. Thanks for coming along on our taste test, and thank you to RJ for bestowing course, your knowledge anytime. on me. I appreciate it. Um, producer Lexi, she's literally tapping her foot to get these beers. So we gotta wrap this thing up. Bye. <laughs>